I would argue that over the last 10 to 15 to maybe 20 years of the NBA, player movement and star movement and free agency and trades have been the dominant storyline of that period in the NBA. And however far back you want to go, whether it be 20 years, 15 years, 10 years, things have changed so much in terms of how stars use free agency, how they use trade requests, what it looks like when they do want to leave a team. And it's such an interesting timeline to take a look at. Really quickly though, I want to thank the sponsor of today's video, Prize Picks. Prize Picks is a fantastic way to play player props. And all you do is you go onto the app, you look at the numbers that they have set for these different players. You pick between two to five players that you like. You select over or under on those numbers. And if you're right, you can win up to 10 times on your winnings. And the really cool thing about this is it's a great way to kind of test your own basketball prediction skills without getting any of your buddies involved for an actual fantasy league. It's just you against Prize Picks. Now, now, those of you that have been watching my videos recently know that we've had prize picks as a sponsor a few times now, but their new promo is out of control. If you use code sporting or click the link in the description and you're a first time depositor, when you place a $5 play, if Kevin Durant scores a single point in any of Brooklyn's remaining first round series games against Boston, you get a $50 promo credit. Now, I know KD's been struggling, probably had his worst playoff game ever in game two, but he's going to score at least a single point in any of Brooklyn's remaining games. And again, if that happens and you use the code or click the link to place a $5 play as a first time depositor, you get 50 bucks. So again, the code is sporting. The link is down in the description. And thanks again to Prize Picks for sponsoring this video. So as we look at this evolution of player movement, for me, phase one really goes back to kind of the, the KG Minnesota days. There, there are times before that, certainly, where players were asking out or they wanted to leave or they wanted to request a trade. But in terms of the modern era, I feel like KG wanting to leave Minnesota and similarly, Chris Paul wanting to leave uh, the Hornets at the time, those are really kind of the two examples that stick out to me of where this all starts. Because Kevin Garnett never officially requested a trade. And that was the difference back then is guys might have wanted to leave. They might have been unhappy, but they weren't as outward about it. They weren't using free agency. They weren't using uh, a trade request as a tool or as leverage. They wanted to be loyal for the most part to their initial team. And then things went so poorly that they just had to ask out because they weren't having the kind of success they hoped for, for example, with Chris Paul. Then at that point, they decided to move on. But again, the distinction there is that they weren't being outward about it. They weren't being public about it. They weren't using agents and, and leverage to try and get out. And for a lot of people that are fans of the NBA, that was, that was a better era for them when it comes to player movement. And then we take a huge jump into phase two, which is just the decision. LeBron James deciding to go to Miami and creating the Heatles was a, a watershed moment within the NBA. It's something we're going to look back on for forever as something that completely changed the way that we think about player movement and, and, and the player empowerment of players in the NBA. Because it wasn't just LeBron in 2010 or, or Chris Bosh in 2010 going to Miami or the craziness of that summer where Chicago at one point thought that they were getting LeBron and D-Wade or Chris Bosh or some combination. We saw guys like Carlos Boozer move to different teams. It wasn't just that, but it was the things that followed. Guys like Carmelo Anthony getting his way to New York. Dwight Howard with whatever in the world happened with him in Orlando where he wanted out, then he didn't, then he stayed, then he opted in, then he ultimately goes to the Lakers. And that being really detrimental to his career, there are positives and negatives for each of these. But this is a real differentiator that really pushed us towards kind of the super modern version of player movement in the NBA. And for me, included in this phase is Kevin Durant deciding to go to Golden State and, and what that, that cap spike and the circumstances of that meant because we went from a situation where everybody hated LeBron for going to Miami in the first place. Nobody liked the decision that he made. They didn't like the way that he went about it. And then kind of the next evolution of that within this same phase was Kevin Durant going to Golden State. And that was an incredibly weird circumstance. Thinking about the cap spike that allowed Golden State to sign Durant, they never would have been able to sign him if it wasn't for that cap spike in 2016. The fact that like LeBron left Cleveland to go to Miami. And that was seen as, well, he's upgrading to a, a better franchise, a better organization, but he didn't go to a team that they literally just lost to in the playoffs. And that was the, the, that was the case for Kevin Durant. People hated Kevin Durant for that. And I think a lot of the backlash that he received from that also kind of affected this next phase. And then we moved to phase three, which I think is the most underrated part of this entire evolution. Kawhi Leonard deciding to leave San Antonio the way that he did it really paved the way for the 2022 version of player movement, because it wasn't just that he wanted to leave his team. It wasn't even just that he wanted to use his free agency to leverage that. We saw that with LeBron before. It wasn't even just that he requested a trade. We'd seen that before as well. But it was the way that he went about it. And it was the fact that he was requesting a trade from a successful team. At that point, everything 
Everything was on the table, nothing was off limits. When Kawhi, who we all thought of as a very team-based guy, someone that was not that much of an individual and cared about the team and didn't care that much about himself and, and his own accolades. When that guy decided to leave San Antonio, that everything was on the table. The Kevin Durant thing did not really seem like as big of a deal. The LeBron thing certainly did not seem like as big of a deal. And the way that he went about it, where he was hurt, decided not to play, was distrusting uh, of the medical staff there in San Antonio and just said, I'm not playing for you. I will leave in free agency. I will wait however long that I need to. I am not playing. That hard line stance is a really, really critical point in this evolution, which leads us to phase four, which is the modern version of this. And basically the best example of this is Ben Simmons. There are other examples, whether it be uh, James Harden or other guys, but the, the, the contract stuff means absolutely nothing. In previous versions of this, in previous phases, in order to really leverage your ability to move teams or request a trade or leave in free agency, the, the contract mattered. It mattered how many years you had left. It mattered how much money you were being paid. And you could leverage that. If you were a free agent, for example, Paul George forcing his way to Oklahoma City, if you were a free agent in a year, you could tell the team, hey, I'm going to leave in a year, trade me now and get something for me because I'm going to leave. But once we started getting into the situation with Harden and Simmons, where you had multiple years left on your deal, the, the, the contract stuff just never mattered anymore. And guys were willing, in Simmons's case, to just sit out the season, even if they weren't hurt. They just, I, I'm not going to play for you. Trade me, get some value. I don't care. I, I don't care that we almost made the finals the year before. I don't care about any of that. Just get me out. And kind of hand in hand with that is this idea that pretty much any option was on the table from a team perspective because before everybody was kind of you know making sure they had all this cap space together they were saving cap space for certain summers in which they knew the big time free agents were going to be available 2010 being the perfect example of that but then we started to see D'Angelo Russell get signed and traded in exchange for Kevin Durant and Jimmy Butler getting signed and traded to Miami teams without cap space or without the necessary cap space to make these kinds of moves happen were able to bring in guys like D'Angelo Russell in the Warriors case or Jimmy Butler in the Heat's case even without that space and so it opened up this whole new realm of possibilities where the contract doesn't matter for the player cap space doesn't matter for the team and all that matters is the destination and the situation that the player wants to be in and their willingness to just completely sit out no matter what just changed everything. But that's not the end of the evolution, not, not by a long shot. Because now we start to look at what's the future of this gonna look like? What's the fifth phase of this gonna look like? And I, I think Zion is the guy. We, we've never really seen someone go through what Zion's going through right now. It's unparalleled throughout the history of the league. Zion has played basically one full season in the entirety of his career. He was basically an all NBA player in that one season. The other two years, he has basically not played and does not seem enthused about playing for New Orleans moving forward. And this is a New Orleans team that's pretty decent. They've built something around him. If he were to return, they could probably win 50 games next year, but he doesn't care. He doesn't want to be there, it doesn't seem like. He's using uh, you know, these injuries and things like that as a way to potentially force his way out, a theme similar to what we've seen with Ben Simmons. And then you go to the rookie extension stuff. For the entirety of the time that we've had this version of rookie deals in the NBA, it's been understood that you are with the team that drafted you for at least the first seven or eight years of your career, assuming that you were successful, with the exception of the Chris Stapps Porzingis situation where he forced his way out. Zion could change that. This could be the new norm moving forward for rookies, where if you're really good, it doesn't really matter if you sign that initial max. The way it would work is you'd play out your first four years in the NBA. After your fourth year, you'd sign a one-year deal. You'd become unrestricted in the fifth year rather than restricted after the fourth year, and you would be able to go wherever you wanted to. That's not really a threat for teams right now, but if Zion or someone else were to follow through with it, that could be the new evolution. That first seven or eight years you're supposed to be with your initial team could shrink down to four to three if you were to force your way out beforehand. That be could become that much more of a threat. And the funny thing is, if you think about that possibility of Zion leaving before his rookie contract is even up, and then compare that to how much people hated LeBron for leaving and going to Miami in the first place, nobody really cares anymore. Nobody really cares when guys leave via free agency. It's so normal. And I think ultimately, eventually, if Zion does do the rookie extension thing where he just leaves and goes somewhere else, that'll become normal as well. And there won't be this negative perception around it. And that will then allow even more players to go through it. I think that's the kind of the through point of this whole evolution is one guy sets a precedent, LeBron in 2010, Kevin Durant in 2016, and then other guys follow through on it and it becomes more and more normal and it becomes less and less criticized to the point where we have evolved to where Zion might not even finish his rookie deal with the Pelicans. 
Which brings up this other question of, are we letting, you know, these younger players kind of run the league too much? There's guys getting max contracts after playing 70, 80 games. Michael Porter Jr. has not played very many NBA games and he got a max rookie extension. Zion has played one full season. Granted, he was incredible and he has all this leverage to just decide where he wants to go over the next couple of years if he's willing to not get paid that much in his fifth season. And so the question is, is that too much power for them to have? The second question is, is that good or bad for the league? And the third question is, is there any way for the NBA to regulate? There's probably answers to each of these, but I think the, the, the common thread here is that this kind of stuff is here to stay. And whatever the next evolution of this is 15, 20 years from now, whether it be within a new CBA, a new loophole that is found, a new way that they're structuring contracts, things are going to continue to change and they're going to continue to evolve. And quite frankly, for me, I mean, it's fantastic for content. And it's one of the things that I love the most about the NBA. And you could say that, well, they're going to change everything in the new CBA and they're going to make it much more difficult. They've tried that before. At a certain point, the owners in the league, they were saying, well, we've got too many bad contracts on the books. We've got guys signing for six years, seven years, and a ton of money. So they shorten the contracts. And then that allowed the players to jump around and have signed one and one deals and constantly sign new maxes and, and really control their, their future entirely. And so they're always going to find a new way to do this. It's going to continue to evolve. And I think it's going to look something similar to like what we've talked about in this video, where 20 years from now, there's going to be four different new phases about how players are able to, to move around and change teams because it's what they want to do. They want to play with who they want to play with and where they want to play at. And if you're good enough, you earn that right. And I think it's going to continue to happen.